Hello. Welcome back to another episode of Tu Esquina Filosófica, your philosophical corner. In today's episode, podcast, video, we will be going over the book Philosophy in the Present. It is a book that is based on a dialogue in Vienna that took place between French philosopher Alain Badiou and Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek. And the structure that today's dialogue is going to take place is going to be uh, how it went chronologically in the book. So first we're going to go over Alain Badiou's introduction on thinking the event. And then we will be talking about uh, Slavoj Žižek's introduction on philosophy is not a dialogue. And then they go into a short dialogue, but I will summarize those and the points made. So let's get started. Alain Badiou outlines first and foremost what the task of philosophy and the philosopher is. He says it nicely in the following quote, a genuine philosopher is someone who decides on his own account what the important problems are, someone who proposes new problems for everyone. Philosophy is first and foremost this, the invention of new problems. From here we have Alain Badiou saying that the task of philosophy is creating new problems from the situations that are presented to the philosopher. So when does the philosopher intervene? When does the philosopher create these new problems? He goes on to say that the philosopher jumps in when he sees the signs that make it available for him to come in and explore new problems. The situation in which we see these signs is what he goes on to call philosophical situations. But do you then outlines the three tasks the philosopher has when he encounters a philosophical situation? The first task is related to choice. It is the task of the examining of choice in the event, a task that analyzes the relation or lack thereof between interest and disinterest. The following task is the task that analyzes distance. What do we mean by distance? Well, distance between power and thinking. Essentially, the distance between the truth and the state. And to measure this distance, to know whether or not it could be crossed. Lastly, the third task of the philosopher is to analyze the value of exception. Essentially, the value of the event. The situation in which the regular order of life, the regular continuity of life, is broken. The realm of philosophy is thus the realm of the break, the realm of the chaotic split from everyday life. And the paradox of this is that while examining the break, the lack of relation between the ordinary uh, everydayness of life what we examine it through is through stories through relation so essentially the paradox is that in order to examine the lack of relation we have to do it entrenched within the paradigm of, of, of a relation but you states that and I quote we can say that philosophy which is the thought, not of what there is, but of what is not what there is. Not of contracts, but of contracts broken. Philosophy is exclusively interested in relations that are not relations. He then goes on to say that Plato once said that philosophy is an awakening. He knew perfectly well that awakening implies a difficult break with sleep. For Plato already, and for all of time, Philosophy is the seizure by thought of what breaks with the sleep of thought. Essentially, it is not because things exist in the world that there is philosophy. Things can exist in the world and there cannot be philosophy. Philosophy comes about when things exist in a state of paradox. When things is, exist, in a, in a sense, in a state of contradictions. In a state of breaks from the everydayness of life, in a state of a relation that is not really a relation. 
when those things exist in life is when philosophy can do its job as an interpreter of those things, as a creator of problems. What does this task of philosophy tell us about the philosopher and the discipline itself? It tells us that the discipline, when in comparison to regular society, is taking place in the realm of the foreign. It's taking place in the realm of the other. Not in the Lacanian sense, of course, but it takes, it takes the form of the stranger, the philosopher, by mere essence dealing with what breaks radically from the everydayness of the world by the mere goal of analyzing relations that are not relations proposes things that seem to be out of this world. In essence, the philosopher has to be what, what many may call utopic. It has to um, bring about things, bring about ideas, critiques, affirmations, that are seemingly out of this world. Why does the philosopher deal with this realm? Why does it deal in the realm of the paradox? Why does he deal with the realm of relations that are not relations, with the realm of clear splits from everydayness? Well, Badiou argues that he does so because he is fundamentally concerned with the uncovering of universal principles. After this, Badiou lays down eight theses. The first one states that thought is the proper medium of the universal. Thought refers to the subject insofar as it is constituted through a process that cuts through the totality of established knowledge. The universal is essentially an objective. It can be experienced only through the production or reproduction of a trajectory of thought, and this trajectory constitutes or reconstitutes a subjective disposition. The opening up of the possibility of the universal is the precondition of the being of the subject at the individual level. The universal is always an incalculable emergence rather than a discernible structure. Distinctions between the particular and the singular. The particular is discernible in knowledge by descriptive predicates. The singular is that which, although identifiable, as a procedure at work in a situation is nevertheless subtracted from every predicative description. That is the summary of the first thesis. The second thesis is much shorter in what it says. He basically just states that every universal is a singular or a singularity. There is no universal sublation of a particular such, of a particularity as such. Then in thesis three, he states that every universal originates in the event and the event is intransitive to the particularity of the situation. The universal emer emerges as a singularity. What we have to begin with is a precarious supplement whose sole strength lies in there being no available predicative capable of subjecting it to knowledge. The universal is thus an unpredicatable singularity. It is a break of the social norm manifested through the subjective thought. In the fourth thesis, he states that a universal initially presents itself as a decision about something that is undecidable. The event through which the universal manifests itself is itself a manifestation of affirmation in a problem previously considered undiscernible. It is the transcendence in a field from opinion to truth. In the fifth thesis, he states that the universal has an implicative form. It verifies the consequence that follows from the eventual statement to which the vanished event indexed. In the sixth thesis, he states that the registering of the universal act is univocal. Every universal singularity can be defined as the act to which the subject thought becomes bound in such a way as to render that act capable of initiating a procedure which affects a radical modification of the logic of the situation and hence of what appears insofar as it appears. In the seventh thesis he states that every, every universal singularity remains an incomplete uh, openness. There's always something open and incomplete 
to it. And then in the eighth thesis, he states that universality is nothing more than the faithful construction of an infinite generic multiple. Generic multiplicity taken as a multiple such that to belong to it cannot be a result of having an identity of possessing any particular property inscribed in it is not any particular determination. So to give a sort of summary of what these eight theses are about, the universal arises according to the chance of an aleatory supplement. It leaves behind a simple detached statement as a trace of the disappearance of the event that founds it. It initiates its procedure in the univocal act through which the valence of what was devoid of valence comes to be decided. It binds to this act a subject thought who will invent consequences for it. It faithfully constructs an infinite generic multiplicity. It is these eight theses, along with the definition of a paradoxical or philosophical situation, that presents us with the answer to the question of what we shall be committed to as philosophers in the present. As we conclude Badiou's introduction, now it's time to examine Shishak's, and it is titled, Philosophy is not a dialogue. Shishak begins with the idea that every attempt to make a dialogue out of philosophy has proven to be vastly unsuccessful and led to disastrous misunderstandings. He states that Aristotle didn't fully understand Plato, that Hegel clearly didn't understand Kant, and that Heidegger didn't understand anyone. Thus, philosophy is not a dialogue, it is axiomatic. On the topic of what is being demanded of philosophers, in specific, the interviews and questioning on current affairs and so on, Shishak states that these are all false demands, but they allude to a real problem that they simultaneously conceal. These false demands can be seen in the creation of a disjunctive synthesis, in the pointing of false demands. For example, in the American political scene, there's a disjunctive synthesis, or the false alternatives, of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Each side presents itself as radically different, uh, a radically different alternative to the other, when in the sphere of the real, both parties uphold pretty much the same ideals. The disjunctive synthesis here creates parameters of thought and concepts within the political arena. The philosopher's role in the breaking of the disjunctive synthesis is through creating new concepts which, through which the debate revolves around, essentially creating new parameters for the debate and new concepts for it. In the realm of academia, we see the disjunctive synthesis within seemingly rival philosophical theorists who in the political realm all fall in agreement. Such, such is the case Shishak presents with Habermas and Derrida. The disjunctive synthesis is in the comple complementariness of the apparent opposite. Shishak presents the example of the philosophical dialogue about virtual reality. The question is essentially do we lose contact with reality if we are in a virtual universe? The disjunctive synthesis response can be seen through the postmodern acceptance of the paradigmic shift from one virtual reality to the next, or through the conservative statements of the return to a more authentic experience. Shishak advises doing something completely different. He says we must reject the, concept, the concepts of the debate and claim not that virtual reality is the problem, but rather the reality of the virtual is. This reminds me very much of a work by Bishop Fulton Sheen titled Liberal or Reactionary. In this work, he demonstrates the sameness underlying the apparent opposition and in doing so also underlines the boundaries the disjunctive synthesis creates. Sheen ends up making a similar point to Shishek, which is the emphasis of the need to change the concepts of the debate. Instead of focusing on traditional or fashionable values, focus on an objective virtuous value that transcends the disjunctive synthesis presented. Shishak then moves on to make the point that there is a paradox in today's hedonism, which is the enforcing of constant enjoyment entrenched in radical prohibition. Basically, enjoy that cake, but you better run five miles tomorrow and eat only celery juice. In the sublime object of ideology, Shishak lays out the conception of the Frankfurt School on ideology as a distortive manifestation of reality, which is itself a necessary element of the real.
I think that this is what we find in the radical prohibition of today's hedonism. It is not that the radical prohibition distorts our ability to be good hedonists, or that our hedonistic impulses distort our ability to properly be disciplined. Rather, that they are both necessary elements of the manifestations of the real in today's capitalism. Whichever one a person determines to be the distortive force that's on the real, the reality is that the apparent distortive force is part of the essential of the real. Shishak then moves on to display the philosophical paradox of the critique of capitalism from Habermas and Adorno and other theorists, critical theorists from the Frankfurt School, which is that through the critique of capitalism, without making an affirmation, we find the affirmation of the thing that is being critiqued. By critiquing capitalism, but not affirming an alternative, consequentially, we find an alternative of what is what was critiqued, the affirmation of capitalism through the critique of capitalism. This paradox is found in today's state philosophers, the Neo-Kantians, whose role is to tactically tolerate scientific and technical development, but control its effect under the symbolic order. It is the endorsement of capitalism through the obscuring of the ethical consequences of capitalism. Essentially here the paradox that Shishak is pointing to is that when you critique without making an alternative affirmation, right? What, it, what goes on is that there is left over a void of an affirmative. And since you give no alternative affirmation, that void is taken up by the thing that you're critiquing. So in this case, it is, it is capitalism. And, and thus, it, it ends up being presented as an evil in your criticism. But since you're consequentially affirming it, it, is, it comes out as an evil that is the lesser evil of the other alternatives. Concluding Shishak's introduction, we jump into the discussion. But Yu begins by making connection to two points that Shishak alluded to. The first is that philosophy needs to be able to grasp that in the truths uncovered through its creation of new problems, there is something that is irreducible to any conception of human nature. Essentially, there is always something inhuman in what philosophy deals with. Whether we label it God, the infinite, the intelligible, the absolute, etc., we can change the names, the names around, but it always remains as an area not reducible to the human, something essentially inhuman. Philosophy diminishes itself when confined to the mere human, but you states that it was already Foucault who stated that man is a kind of theoretical construct of his own history. We can see when this construct was created, and we'll see when it ends. This is the view that led to the movement of theoretical anti-humanism in France. The second observation is that in Kant is where we find the theme of the universal singularity. But you asserts that Shishak was right to state this. That in every good philosopher we find a direct participation of a singularity in the universal. The direct, the direct link between the singularity and the universal presupposes that there is something inhuman in universality. In Kant we see this relation of the universality and the, univer and the singular in that human thought when he defines, in human thought when he defines human by means that exceed humanity. But you states that the greatness of Kant is to have combined the idea of a limit of reason with its opposite, the idea of an excess of humanity with regard to itself, which is given in particular in the infinite character of practical reason. Is man destined to finitude, including the finitude of humanity itself, or is there instead a capacity for the inhuman, which is ultimately what philosophy is concerned with? That is the real question according to Badiou. But you believes that these two things, the connection of the singularity and the universal, and the necessity of overcoming humanism, are two observations that can be brought together. Shishak responds by agreeing with Badiou and states that, and I quote, the human as such only appears in the non-human. The non-human is the only way to be human in the universal sense in an immediate way, end quote. The reasoning for this comes from Kant's distinction of the negative and infinite judgment. 
The negative judgment denies the subject a predicate. For example, the soul is not mortal. The infinite judgment ascribes to the subject a negative predicate. The soul is immortal. Shishak then uses Stephen King's horror novels to bring it all together, specifically the notion of the undead. As we know, when we say dead, we think of no longer living. When we say that something is not dead, we think that it's alive. But when we hear undead, we are able to realize that no, the subject is not alive. He is dead, but he's not dead dead. He is alive, but dead. He is a living dead. This undead, to Shishek, is Kant's transcendental subject. It is non-human precisely in this sense. Non-human, not in the sense of the animalistic, but rather as an excessive dimension of the human itself. But Dieu then speaks on a conception that many philosophers have, which is that philosophy's main goal is critical. He says that this is not true, that this places philosophy with a negative task. But Dieu states, on the other hand, that philosophy's main role is affirmation. Philosophy sees the paradox and intervenes, but intervenes not just to criticize, but to make an affirmation. To redefine the concepts of the discourse, and consequently the parameters of it. Thus, the inhuman cannot be understood as just a negation. It is an affirmation from which one thinks of the displacement of the human. The displacement of the human always presupposes that one has accepted the initial correlation is between the human and the inhuman, and not the per perpetual human as such. Shishak then states that paradoxically this is what they have in common with postmodern critical pessimists, the necessity of, destructing, of, of, of destroying the human. The difference is that the postmodern the postmodernist considers the inhuman a, 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 a terrifying excess that must be avoided. A kind of, kind of like Edgar Allan Poe's quote, live in the edge of the abyss. It is a matter of maintaining proper distance, not doing so to act as if there is no evil, rather just to not fall into that evil. The postmodern conception is the opposite of what is propagated with Shishak and Badiou's inhuman as a space of redefinition. Shishak warns against this position of mere critique with no affirmation by demonstrating how Horkheimer and Adorno, although quite critical of Western capitalism, when a concrete situation presented itself with the Vietnam War, they affirmed the position of what they were supposedly critical of, both siding to various extents with the American Empire. Horkheimer mentioning that American soldiers bring freedom to wherever they go, and Adorno stating the cheap excuse that he was too fat in order to not protest against the Vietnam War. Shishak sums up this paradox as, and I quote, the sad philosophical teaching that an apparent radical condemnation of evil can perfectly take over the function of blocking any alternatives, end quote. By criticizing without affirming an alternative, we leave the void of an alternative open for the thing we critique to fill it up. It represents a pseudo-critique which affirms what is being critiquing what is being critiqued as evil, but the least evil out of the alternatives. It is an insincere critique which dictates the parameters of the alternative critiques and affirmations. But you follows up by saying that the paradox of non-affirmation is at the essence of today's political discourse. It is okay and even to some extent fashionable to label oneself as an anti-capitalist. The problem arises in the affirmation of a post-capitalist ideology. Like Shisha states afterwards, they praised him for all of his works on Marx, but once he wrote about Lenin, that's when the problem came. It is the controlling of discourse to where an extent you can criticize it as long as the criticism is not followed by an alternative affirmation. But you also seize this situation in regards to democracy and the question of whether we can define democracy as something besides the parliamentary form of politics that we use to label as democracy. I think there is a good example to demonstrate this. 
Silvio Rodriguez, a Cuban revolutionary folk singer who because of his fame gets many interviews outside of Cuba, just had an interview that I saw with Jamie Bailey, a Peruvian talk show host and a mouthpiece of the Cuban opposition in Miami. He asked Silvio the question that as an artist, doesn't the absence of democracy in Cuba concern him? Silvio's response represents this break from the liberal democratic conception of democracy that Badiou refers to. He stated that in Cuba precisely there is a democracy, just not the kind that fits into the liberal bourgeois conception of it. Here is precisely what the essence of the philosophical commentary must come in. When the presented paradox promotes a disjunctive synthesis, you are either a liberal democracy, you are either pro-liberal democracy or pro-tyranny. The philosopher must be skeptical to this. He must redefine the concepts at play and change the parameters of the discussion. When that happens, the affirmations given would be like that of Silvio's. At this point, the conversation is handed over to Shishak, where he presents one more paradox. The paradox of political correctness, which manifests itself as the open tolerance of everything. By tolerance, they mean no harassment. Harassment, which is manifested as the suppressing of desires. Essentially, don't come too close to me. If you look at someone too long, it's visual harassment. If you say something dirty, it's ver uh, verbal harassment etc. This, according to Shishak, shows us that tolerance in this context is precisely a form of intolerance. Intolerance for the closeness of the other. Similar to the paradox of tolerance, Western democracy has the same paradox. He uses the example of Bush's election in, two, in the year 2000. He states that, and I quote, it was clear the whole time that despite the manipulation, there were rules that had to be upheld no matter what. Therefore, democracy means today, in the first place, even in the case of vulgar injustice, injustice over disorder, injustice rather than disorder." End quote. He states that democracy is, a, is fetishized by democratic representatives because of the disconnect it gives them from being able to be held responsible for their actions as they can quickly alienate the responsibility on the people and state that what was done was decided by the people, not themselves. Shishak states that 1989 was not representative of the end of the communist utopia, rather the unleashing of liberal capitalist utopia marked by Fukuyama's end of history. He states that the ideological representation of September 11th is that the liberal, capital, the liberal capitalist utopia is not dead. The democracy that has remained is just a democracy of name. No one actually believes there is democratic content behind the word. Global capitalist processes exclude the capacity for democracy while paradoxically maintaining it as the ideal. Well folks, that's all for the recapitulation of the text. But I want to present the audience with a question I am sincerely interested in hearing your responses to. So Shishak and Badiou, but specifically Shishak in reference to the question, talks about the paradox of anti-capitalist thinkers like Horkheimer, Adorno, or Habermas, in that while they remain critical of capitalism, they fail to affirm any alternative along with their critique. This leaves a void of an alternative affirmation which is consequentially filled up by the thing they critique, capitalism. Thus, this presents the paradox of a critique that it's not, that's not really critical, given it merely affirms what it apparently critiques. It thus critiques capitalism as evil, but by failing to affirm any alternative, leaves capitalism as a lesser evil than any of the other alternatives. Now, I think Shishak is absolutely right in his observation. A lack of an alternative affirmation subsequently affirms the original critique. My question is, isn't Shishak a victim of this paradox as well? Perhaps not in the theoretical sense since he affirms to being a communist, but in the practical sense. 
Shishak labels the 20th century post-capitalist experiments as terrible failures. In fact, the only post-capitalist experiment he seems to like is Bolivia. Now, isn't this precisely the paradox he is accusing the critical theorist of, except in relation to his theory and praxis? He staunchly criticizes capitalism, but in practice fails to affirm any of the existing and past socialist experiments. Of course, I'm not arguing here for a return to 20th century socialism. Rather, for Shishek, as a self-proclaimed communist, to have a more honest interpretation of the projects his fellow ideologues participated in. Shishek would be right in affirming that 20th century socialism would fail in the 21st century. That is basic dialectics. But what he can't do is make the two mistakes which he makes, which is what eventually leads him to end up in the paradox that he himself conceptualizes. His first mistake is the quick acceptance of the liberal bourgeois narrative and the recapitulation it gives of events. The second is the addressing of these experiments from a secondary standpoint and an analysis of the effect without any regard to the cause that led to those effects. Once again, I find myself referring to Silvio's interview with Bailey. He states, that Cuba was taking away the right to make its own mistakes. It was taking away the right to fail. Why does he state this? Well, simply because, unlike Shizek, Silvio's analysis of the Cuban event doesn't start at the effect of a particular apparent mistake, but rather at the cause that led to the conditions for, those apparent, for that apparent mistake. It starts with the tremendous internal and external pressures brought about by the external imperial force because of the threat to capital that the socialist experiment in Cuba represented. In doing so, he is able to recognize from the start that these pressures represent a handicap and a substantial one on the development of the revolution in Cuba. Thus, although the mistakes made can definitely be called out, what they can't be called out as is as a singular sporadic event. They need to necessarily be contextualized in the imperial causes that led to the situation, at least if we are searching for, as philosophers, truth in a paradoxical situation. Thus, I believe these two failures of Shishek in the practical realm of material interpretations lead to his landing in the paradoxical condition he critiques others for being in. Please let me know in the comment section whether you agree or not with this, with this question that I'm proposing. Also, any feedback on the video would be greatly appreciated. I would like to know what you guys think of not only the final question presented, but overall of the labeling of the tasks of philosophy by Shishek and Badiou. I want to thank all of you who had a chance to hear this video. And if anyone has any specific recommendations for further videos, let me know in the comments. Once again, Thanks for watching this episode of Tu Esquina Filosófica, your philosophical corner. This is Carlos signing out. Thanks.